Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. On the bench today is a radio receiver out of a B-29 aircraft from way back when. Now, when these radios were decommissioned and taken out of these aircraft, they were sold to the surplus market, and they were also sold to you know, ham radio operators and the like. Now, when these radios were in service, they had a dynamotor in them, like the Spillsbury radio that I just did in the last video, which I've had enough votes that, yes, it will get restored. That's going to be a, a mighty lengthy restore. Lots of stuff to do in that thing. But at any rate, back to this receiver here. These things had a dynamotor in them that would make a lot of noise, and they ran off of you know 14 volts or 28 volts or whatever in that area. So... That wasn't desirable for ham radio operators and the surplus market to really do anything with. So the surplus market, the surplus resellers, I should say, they offered usually for about five or ten dollars, they would convert the radio for you by installing a transformer and a rectifier and some filters. And then, of course, ham radio operators just did this stuff themselves. So this radio has had that conversion and it looks like it's probably been done in, oh, I don't know, maybe the 1950s or something like that. So this radio is deemed as parts. This is a parts radio that I purchased. It's missing a whole bunch of just everything. It's missing a lot of stuff. But it would be really interesting to see if the thing actually starts. Will it actually run? So what we're going to do is we're going to put power to this thing and see if it talks to us or if it lets out the magic smoke. So let's find out. Here's the BC-348 that was deemed as a parts unit, and it's missing lots of parts and pieces. All the covers for the coil boxes here are all missing. You can see all the dust that's settled in there over the years. Usually these are spotless inside because they have little covers that screw onto these little tabs. I don't know if you can see them. We see this one here, and here, and here. And anyways, they screw onto the top to keep everything nice and clean because there's a bunch of switches in the bottom here that all get switched by this mechanism here when you change the bands. So you see right over here, there's a big ratchet system here that holds the band switch in place. And if I change the band, you can see that ratchet move and it all goes into different notches. And then that gear down here is changing the band switch. So I'll see if I can get just a touch more light on that. There we go. All right, and I'll move that around and you can see that. So there's switches in each one of these boxes that are all ganged together by one shaft and that shaft sticks out right here. So if I move that, you can see that turn around, see it turning in that little hole right down there. So that changes everything. And what happens is when the tops of these boxes are missing, dust and garbage settles on down inside these things, especially if the case is missing, like it's been missing on this thing for who knows how long. Look at how dirty and disgusting this thing is. So it's, you know, been missing. I've noticed a tube is missing on this side. We'll take a look at that in a moment. The shield is still here, thankfully. They put the shield back because it looks like a, a pretty special shield. It has a, a little shield that sticks off the shield. So the shield goes between the two stages here. So we'll take a look at that in a moment. So we'll have to see what tube is missing out of here. I have another two BC-348s that are going to be restored as well, but they're different inside than this. So actually quite a bit different in this area and this area over here. So it's nice that this is here because I wouldn't have this piece at all. It's also missing a regulator. So a little regulator goes down inside here. So you push it in and it's a glow tube that just glows. So... For those of you that are into electronics and know this, you can use neon bulbs as regulators, and that's basically what that thing is. So a little tube there, so I'll have to find that. I'll have to find this so far. We're going to have to leave the caps off because there aren't just no caps. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take a look at the underside. What else can I show you on the top side here? Oh, the dynamo. So the dynamotor, the dynamotor that normally sits in this area here, like it sat in the Spillsbury and Tyndall radio, has been removed, and somebody has done a very nice job making a power supply. Now, this was really commonly done way back in the day because people don't want to listen to that buzzing and whirring from the dynamotor. So somebody put this in here, and, you know, they have an old directly heated vacuum tube here, which dates the modification, so this is probably done, I would say, probably in the 50s or maybe even in the 60s. 
So they did a, a really nice job. It almost from the top side looks like it's factory. So normally the dynamotor would sit on top of this and uh, these would normally be powered by either 14 or 28 volts. And as you can see, this has a little crusty line cord on it. It's actually not in bad condition. And it has a bunch of bare wires hanging out of the back. So we'll have to locate where all this stuff goes, make sure there's no AC on those bare wires. I have a feeling it's probably for an external speaker. So at any rate, you know, it's got the this standard, you know, butchered up face on it. People have been drilling holes and putting extra switches in these things. It's very hard to find a clean BC348 because so many ham operators got their hands on these things and they thought, oh, I'm going to modify it and make it better. Well, they're a pretty fantastic receiver the way they are. And uh, you can see there's a Bakelite knob here. Normally they're supposed to be Sometimes they're they're known as a toilet flusher. <laughs> so there's a big handle. It looks like a toilet handle, and it goes click 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 click, and that's missing. And somebody they've put a variable control in here. So this has been left alone. This kind of looks like the, with the same kind of switches that would normally be in here. It has the same color to it, but I have a feeling it's also been drilled and butchered in there. What I see a lot of the time, and these are the things you have to look for if you are going to purchase one of these things, you know, look for extra switches and extra knobs. Now, some of the models had this knob, which is a, basically an antenna compensator knob. So a pre-tuning knob over here for the antenna section, and some of them didn't. I find a lot of people, what they do is they remove the antenna jacks down here. And they drill, you know, big holes and put, you know, big jacks on the front and do all that kind of stuff. And they, I don't know, I've seen these, some of these things that are, are pretty bad. So this one is deemed as parts. It's not that bad. Yeah, it's got some holes in the face and it's got this what, silly looking little Bakelite knob here, which I'll have to get replaced. I may put the original uh, automatic voltage control off and then manual voltage control. I may put that back in here again, you know, with a... Uh, you know, the proper toilet flusher handle on the front. Um, usually down here, there are two jacks for speakers. It says tell. So this here has got a switch in the top one. What all of these switches are doing, we'll have to find out. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, lots of butchery going on in this thing. Let's take a look in the bottom here. All right, put this here and I'll adjust the camera. And hopefully I can get most of this in the shot. Just about. The tip of the microphone is right there. I'll just move that out of the way. And in the bottom here, somebody's added an extra tube. So what this does, I have no idea. I imagine it does something. Let's get a little tryout or something. In the bottom, uh, just you know the same old caps and stuff. You know, it's got a bunch of filters down in here and. Probably a, a bunch of things hiding under this platform in the uh, existing power supply that's been added. Uh, somebody's added an audio transformer, looks to be, and we don't even have to find out where these wires go now because they attach right to it. So there you go. It is, uh, it is attached. That looks like it's just about touching that terminal. You see how close that is? Look at that. There's some, there's some good designing right there. Look at that. Somebody's added this in here, and this is like... I'm sure it can touch the corner of that transformer. It is, actually. So, you know, lots of things that would need to be cleaned up, but it looks deemed as a parts unit. I have to say, it looks like it could be salvageable. And any of you that, you know, have watched this channel for a while know that I will not destroy something like this, use it as parts if it can be saved. You know, if I purchased this thing and, you know, these boxes were missing here and maybe the gearing was all gone or something like that, you know, or it had been driven over by a truck or something, you know, of course, then I'll want to, you know, tend to use it as parts. But when something is this incredibly complete, I have a really hard time taking this thing down because this thing might work. Who knows, right? It's looking complete. So on the top side here, you can see you've added a, actually on the back, we'll take a look here first. So it's obviously some ham operator that's owned this. I've just noticed this. This is 40 meters, 80 meters, 10, 20. 
So somebody has, you know, been in here and they've been marking this. So chances are a ham operator did this. It's a nice clean job with the power supply. I can't see the underside because there's kind of a space here and that's hidden. But I'm imagining that the underside probably is looking okay. We'll find out if we see any smoke. Now, this has been added. Something to hold this, right? So, whatever that is. And, uh, yeah. So just lots of... Uh, Lots of modifications that uh, could have been done, could have been done a little bit nicer. Just move the lens in here a little bit and turn this thing around. It's not very light, I can tell you that. You know, they took these things out of those planes, they'd probably get more altitude. So, anyways, so this is how the band switch works here. I don't want too much glare on that. Man, get that out of the way. What is glaring on that? Something is glaring on that pretty bad. Let's see if I can get that out of here. And I'll see if I can get the focus on that. There we go. All right, so you can see this here moves the bands. So this is from 200 to 500 kilocycles, okay? And then you go up to this band, and this is from 1.5 megahertz to 3.5 megahertz, or megacycles, if you prefer, in old speak. 3.5 to 6 megacycles in that band. 6 to 9.5 megacycles, or megahertz if you prefer, it's the same thing. And then on the top band, 9.5 to 13.5. And then I think there might be one more. There is, 13.5 to 18. So now keep in mind, as I'm turning this knob, it's tuning every one of these boxes here. It's, so it's changing a switch, and it's selecting different coils in every one of these boxes, and that's the reason there has to be caps on this. There's going to be a lot of you know, crap that's going to get in there. There's a big variable capacitor under here for the tuning. So you can see this. Right? So it moves very slow. I can very slowly turn this. See if I can hold this steady. You see how slow that's moving? So before the capacitor was almost fully meshed. So now it's opening up. So the capacitance is going down right now. So we're getting less and less capacitance, right? So there's, uh, if you want to look at it between going towards microfarads or going towards picofarads, this would be going towards picofarads right now, okay? Right, and there's a lot of different sections. So each one of these sections are ganged together by a common shaft, and this is tuning each one of those separate sections at the same time. And there's even a variable potentiometer on this side here as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this at the same time. You can see the, you know, the brilliance in the engineers when they put this stuff together. Lots of time and research went into this thing. So, you know, a four gang tuning section on a single conversion super heterodyne receiver is pretty fantastic. So I can tell you that these receivers are pretty good receivers. I'll just show you this here moving. You can watch the little band up here moving. I'm turning this down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reposition the camera. We'll take a look down at the missing tube here and over in this section here. And I'll go grab a bunch of parts, at least what I think will get this thing going. We'll plug it in and see if we can listen to it. Or maybe we'll see something like smoke. Okay, I found a tube and a glow discharge bulb right here. All right, so I'll put this one in. They didn't fool around when they made sure they made contact. So there it is. It's in there. So now this has a regulator. So this requires regulation for stability so that this thing doesn't drift all over the place with, with voltage variation. So look at that. I remove this Brimar tube. This is Brimar radio valve. I remove it. It says, you know, Brimar radio valve on it. Look at that. This is BVA, so let's see, what is it, the British Valve Association, right? British Radio Valve, that's what it stands for. I thought BVA was British Valve Association, but okay, so British Radio Valve, it says right here. You know, I hear the British, they package these tubes like this. I'm just kidding. So obviously somebody's used this in something and taken it out of the box. Okay, so, see down in here. Look at that, hopefully if this tube works, it looks like it's a pull. Maybe another 
tube, something like that. That was, uh, maybe it got replaced and the old one got put in this box. So let's troubleshoot more things than the radio. Let's put a bad tube in there and make our job even worse. Okay, so here we go. Cap is on the top. And that's in there. So what I'll do now is, um, I'll turn this on slowly. So I'll put this into my current limited isolation transformer and variac supply. Make sure that this is right down at the bottom. And I'll turn some lights off here so maybe we can actually see if this glow discharge tube does come on. That's a good indication that the power supply works. So that should come on. I'll just move that over. Okay. So I'll turn this on. Here we go. Okay. So I'm bringing it up to about 30 volts. And it's not pulling a whole lot of current. In fact, it's pulling no current, so that means that this thing might be turned off. Let's see. What would be an on switch? Maybe that's on? Let's find out. Is this on? No. Oh, there it is. It's... Ah, there it is. So it's not clicking on right away. So I'll see if I can make it do that. You know, just wiggle it. Hear that? It clicked on. And I see the current being drawn now. Okay, so... We're getting places. Oh, there it is. So the power supply is working, so if I turn it down... Turn the voltage back up again here. Alright. So I'm up to about 70 volts right now. So it's lighting up. That's a good sign. So that means that the power supply is working. That is a really good sign. You see that? Nice looking little tube. Now you'll notice only one half of it is lighting up. Why is that? Well, that's because they're putting DC into the bulb. You'll notice in neon bulbs, they usually have two little poles inside them, and both the poles are lit up when it's plugged into AC. When you're running on DC, because it's direct current, only one side will light. So depending which way you have the bulb put in, it'll light up either side so that is normal so only one half of that is lit it's looking good okay so i don't see smoke so far i'm going to shut that off we're doing good what i'm going to do is get a speaker and attach an antenna to this thing and let's see if it lives i'm not having a whole lot of faith with this one with the tube in the bottom and everything like that wires poking out of the back put that back over here Okay, I'll go get a speaker. I'll be right back. I have two Allen wrenches or Allen keys, hex keys, whatever you want to call them, on the bench here. And I'll just use these as connections for the antenna and the ground. So these are spring-loaded antenna connections. So I can just push this in. There's a hole in the side. I can just push that little connection through there. So now this little Allen key or Allen wrench is in there. And I'll put this one in the ground and just leave them like that. This is running to my antenna, so I'll just clip this onto the antenna hot lead right here. I'll leave the common unhooked at this point, because depending on the band that I'm on, sometimes this is beneficial and sometimes it isn't. And I'll grab a speaker from the other side here. So it's just an old portable speaker, and I'll plug it in here and see what happens. So hopefully it makes some form of noise, and we'll just go from there. How does that sound? Okay, I'll turn this thing on. And it's still at 70 volts, so I'll just let it sit here for just a moment. The glow tube on the other side just started glowing. It's a nice uh, nice color orange in there. Kind of a creamsicle colored orange. Okay. So I'll turn this up to about 100 volts. And I'll see what's happening here. It's making... it's making noise! It's supposed to be a parts radio. So that is an RF gain. And at the end it seems open. Let's see if this BFO works. Sounds like it's trying to. We need a signal there to get a, a tone. That thing's working. This thing is supposed to be parts. 
And it's even been partially stripped, and the thing's still working. This thing definitely wants to get restored. The Spillsbury and Tyndall was complete. You know, aside from the crystals were missing. Other than that, which doesn't mean a whole lot, because that's just, you know, for the old marine bands at any rate. And it worked. And this thing here missing parts, and it's working. It really goes to show you how resilient these old things really are. Even with that, you know, that tube here that was kind of, you know, sketchy. Okay, so we're on the highest band here. So it does I turn the volume down, because usually these older receivers make a lot of noise when you move the band switch around. You can hear it's trying to pop already. Let's go right down to the bottom, or just about. The bottom, this one here would be beacons. So we'll just go here and see if we can hear any, maybe, anything in the AM broadcast. So, I'll move the an antenna compensator here and see if it peaks things up. It is, so you can hear that. I'll just move this. So the stages are working. So, I'll give it a bit more volume, put this down here just in case it gets loud, and let's see. So that's two megacycles there. I'm trying to receive something. It's receiving. Hello. Wow, the thing is actually receiving. Hard to believe. So see if it's going to receive on a higher band, let's say uh, the time signal. So we'll go up here. Let's just turn this down. We'll go to, it should be around five megacycles. That's where the time signal sits. It's always a good way to test the uh, receiving on this band. It's always a good way to test these things, see how close it is, if it is. So it should be rated around five. So I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit. So it should be right around 5. Sounds like it's there. Something right at 5. I'll attach the ground here. Gets rid of some of the noise. There it is. Wow. This thing is supposed to be parts. How could anybody want to use this thing as parts when it works like this? You know, taking something like this and, you know, using it for parts is crazy. Well, let's see if any of the other bands are noisy. This goes to six, so uh, I'll just turn this down because usually they pop when you change the band switches and make popping noises. Haven't seen any smoke or anything. This is all good. And I can also bring it up to the actual line voltage. We're just at 100 volts right now. So bring it right up to 120. That might pick up the sensitivity as well. The filaments will light up a little brighter. So let's just move it around in this band and see what happens. Put the speaker up here, so hear it. Turn that down a bit. Some computer generated stuff there. Wow, nice and strong. Some shortwave stations in there. Let's move this out of the way for a sec. Turn this down. See. Next band. I 
I don't know if this band's working. I think the oscillator isn't working in this band. Well, maybe it's trying. Yeah, it is. There's a shortwave frequency in there. Not very sensitive. So it's probably detuned or mistuned. Somebody's been in there and tried to tune this for something. So since they were using this for, you know, ham radio use, you know, who knows how many screwdrivers and hands have been in here. Right? Let's see if the time signal's at 10. It should be around 10 as well. So move this all the way down to 10. Take about an hour to get there. Okay, here we go. So let's turn this up. Uh, it doesn't sound very sensitive down here. It might be off. Let's see if it has more sensitivity without it. It's maximum gain down here so obviously this band is very quiet so there should be this should be very loud with static right now so this band is obviously down let's try another one 13.5 to 18 see that's how it should be it should be that loud this is a higher band and it's late at night so it's probably not a whole lot we'll go down to the bottom end here So there should be a time signal at 15 as well. So let's see if there's going to be a time signal up here. Okay, let me attach my antenna common to make things quiet, get lots of volume. There it is. There it is. Let's see if the BFO works. It's working. So the BFO does work. So all in all, this thing is mostly working. One of the bands is very, very quiet on this. So probably, you know, obviously dirt and you know, garbage in the switches. And, you know, if the tubes were all checked and the whole thing was retuned and, you know, replaced the needed components, this thing would just come right back to life again. So, you know, why this thing is deemed as parts, I have absolutely no idea. So, you know, I'd have to fabricate some covers for the top boxes, you know, for the coil boxes and stuff here. And uh, this would make a great restoration. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing, you know. So, I'll just unplug this. Get rid of that hum. So, why this was deemed as parts, I have really no idea. Yeah. Yeah, everything is just it's dirty and disgusting inside, but... It's working not bad for something that was supposed to be in the scrap pile. So, just like the Spillsbury and Tyndall, this will have to get restored because this is so nice. You know, it's working without anything done to it and with all the old co components in it as well, just like the Spillsbury. Absolutely amazing. You know, this is a total testament to the dependability of the stuff created in this era. You know, this is... You know, 1945, maybe 1943, 1945 in that era is when this radio was made. So we're talking, you know, 75 plus years of, you know, and it's still going. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Definite restoration coming soon. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. 
I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at solid state electronic devices and vacuum tube electronic devices. So there's a lot of really interesting things coming. I also have a lot of very interesting electronic things that you may not have seen before. It's a lot of very interesting technologies I've got that I'm going to slowly bring out and we're going to go through together. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you want to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap that bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I've also released many of my personal inventions and designs there. I've designed a lot of different pieces of test equipment that many people have built and are benefiting from at this time. I'll put the link just below the show more tab, just below this video's description. So if you click on the show more tab, it will expose the link. And I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.